So we wrapped up last time talking about how the earth would be better off if humans went extinct, right? This. So we basically wrapped up population ecology, talking about human population, which is where we jokingly refer to the voluntary human extinction movement. Basically, there are just a lot of us on the planet, right? We've, we have far exceeded our, our previous carrying capacity. So the question is, where does it end, right? That's sort of the, the take home message at the end of the population section. So we're gonna go ahead and move forward to community ecology. So switching gears, um, next week, We'll do the Kahoot that I told you guys about, where it's like name that ecology. We'll give you some practice of the types of questions that I'll ask you guys to do um, on the exam with sort of making your own case for whether an experiment is looking at um, the ecology on the population level or the community level or the ecosystem level. So we'll do that Monday after we finish community ecology. And uh, maybe we'll save it for Wednesday so we go through ecosystem ecology first. Anyway, that'll be next week. But next week is our last week of class. Um, our last day of class is Monday the 3rd, right, which is only a week and a half away. That's the day we'll do our optional discussion. So the third discussion is optional. If you have um, earned all of your discussion points so far, which means you've been at and participated in one, two, then three will be extra credit. So if you come, what we're going to do is watch um, a nature documentary on Netflix. And um, it's actually really good. It's not like one of the ones you've seen on like high school projectors that make you go to sleep. It's actually pretty interesting and it's very relevant to climate um, climate changes and biodiversity loss and things like that, which is what we're really talking about. So we'll watch that video um, together on Monday the 3rd. If you want the extra bonus points, then come watch the movie. There'll be a little movie guide to watch, uh, to fill out while you're watching and that'll earn you like 10 bonus points if you already have both of your discussion grades. If you are missing a discussion grade, this one can replace that one. Okay, does that make sense? So if you have a zero for two or one of our first discussions, um, this one would be 30 points, but takes the place of one you're missing. So if you need it for the credit, you can make up the credit. If you don't need it, if you already have the first two, it's 10 points bonus if you come. Either way, it's optional. I think that makes sense. I'll try to post it in an announcement in a way that explains everything so that um, it's clear what's going on. So that's our plan for the last day. So we'll do community ecology today. I think we'll get all the way through. Um, if we do get all the way through a little bit early, I may let you guys out a few minutes early just because I need to get to a webinar that's starting uh, five minutes ago, um, if possible, but we'll see how that goes. So then that leaves us with ecosystem ecology for Monday and a really short um, visit into biodiversity and conservation on Wednesday in our movie on Monday for the optional discussion and then we're done. So um, the more important thing is the poster, but we'll talk about that, like I said, towards the end so that in case other people start sort of streaming and we'll, we'll wait for them. All right, so let's get to community ecology. So what um, what is it that takes us up a level from population ecology to community? What are we studying? What do you guys think? So we're not just looking at a population with one species, yeah, multiple populations and how they interact with one another. So we start talking about um, some of the ways that populations interact, how they depend on one another, how they compete with one another, um, and all those types of, of interesting things. So populations of one species never live in isolation. We've talked about that a couple of times, right? Nothing lives in a vacuum. Um, and so community ecology just looks at those interactions and how those how those interactions affect both or more, more it can be more than two, it can be three or four or a whole community. Um, how those interactions affect the populations that participate in them. Okay, so we're taking it up a, a little notch in complexity and looking at those types of things. So how are the how do populations interact? We've definitely touched on this already. Remember, I told you when we first started ecology that these chapters are going to be really overlapping. There's going to be a lot of overlap in terminology and concepts because it's ecology, and that's the whole point, right? Um, did we ever talk about the word ecology and what it means? You guys know where the root word for ecology comes from? Or what does ecology mean? We've, we've said it's the study of, of populations and communities and, and ecosystems, right? But you know what the word means? You know, like eco is always referring to the earth, right? Like this is e 
eco-friendly or this is your I drive a car with eco boost or whatever right the term eco sort of gets, um, associates with environment right it actually comes from the Greek word oikos you guys know that word from the yogurt you know what I'm talking about it's like a brand of yogurt called oikos it means house in Greek um, so I don't know if that has to do with the yogurt, but for eco and oikos, that's where the root word comes from. So really studying our home, which is kind of cool to think about just the etymology of the term um, ecology. But anyway, that's just some trivia for you. So we're studying our home. So what are some of these ways that populations can interact? We're going to look at predator-prey dynamics. We've talked about that, of course, a little bit already. Um, competition for resources, competition for space, competition for pretty much anything that there's not enough of to go around. Um, and we'll talk about symbiosis as well. So we, we started off strong with symbiosis when we did our endosymbiosis um, lesson and discussion early on talking about um, evolution of eukaryotes. But we're going to talk a little bit more about those. And then um, we'll talk about diversity and sort of how we measure diversity in communities. Um, communities are incredibly diverse for the most part, right? Because you're talking about all of the populations that are living and, and interacting together. Um, so when you look at that, we're going to do some counting. Just like we count populations, we'll also count communities. So diversity refers to the number of species living in a place. Just like you can count population size, you can count diversity. Um, we'll also look at relative diversity, which means really like relative to the other populations that are living around you, how much of the community do you make up? Okay, so if you are 80% of the of the number of individuals in a community, then you're making up a lot then, right? So we're going to look at some measures of relative diversity also. Um, and even if you have communities with low diversity, there's still a lot to look for, right? Because you have to take into consideration microorganisms, right? Fungi and uh, single cell eukaryotes and micro uh, prokaryotes, right? So you've got all, all kinds of diversity going on, even if you can't really see it, obviously. And then when you look at places like the tropics, where life is encouraged because environmental conditions are so good for productivity, then you get these extremes of diversity that you can't even count, right? So there are species that we haven't even found yet. Every group of organisms that we've talked about thus far has been um, that same pattern where we said, here's how many we think there are, but there's probably more, right? Because we're always finding new, new species. So diversity is, that's basically diversity. Who's there, how many, in what numbers? So we'll talk about that in this um, section of the chapter. So the first part we'll look at is predator-prey interactions. Um, this should be, again, review, right? We've talked about this. This is a, a pretty classic case of um, you, that we use to teach predator-prey interactions because it's really obvious the link between um, these two organisms and their, their populations. So what we're looking at here um, is the relationship between the snowshoe hare, right, this little white bunny, and the Canada lynx, which is a cat, right, that's going to prey upon the hares. It's the cat eats the hares. Um, and this graph is going from its number of animals, right? So this population and thousands of animals um, over time, and it starts in the 1840s. So this population study, uh, community uh, interaction study started a long time ago, and we've been collecting data on these populations ever since. And so we have a really good, uh, robust data set, which is what makes this so valuable to look at these um, interactions and relationships over time. So, Again, with the graphs, right? Ecologists love models and graphs. So that's what we're looking at here. Um, what do you guys notice? So the red line, or the line under, what's colored under red, is the hair population. Okay, that's your prey item. And then the bluish, light blue tracing, that's the lynx population. What do you guys notice when you, at first glance, what's the first thing that you sort of pick up on when you look at that graph? Anything sort of jump out at you? More hairs than links. That's a good observation. That makes sense because these are predators and prey, right? If you have more predators than you have prey, you're probably out of balance, right? Does that make sense? You're going to quickly lose predators. And that's also part of what we're seeing here. And we'll look at that in a second. What else besides just numbers? What do you notice about the two uh, different data sets, the links data set and the hair data set? How would you describe that interaction? Yeah. They have a relationship that one goes after the other, but the links are the only way to get to the species. 
Yeah, exactly. So if you guys didn't hear what Michael said, they, they're related, right? They go uh, when one goes up, the other goes up, but it's a little bit of a delay. That's exactly what's going on here, and it's cyclical, right? So the figure um, caption tells you that it's cycling of these two populations, um, which is a good example of predator prey dynamics. So what happens? Um, let's look at let's start here where the hare population is climbing, right? To so go from a low population up to a high population. Well, look here. So it was low when we first started here, right? So that's a pretty low population of um, prey items. And what's going on with the predator population right around this same time that follows not too far behind, maybe by what? That's 20 years, so maybe a year or so, year or two, behind this low dip in the number of uh, prey items, you see what? Yeah, pretty sharp decline in the lynx population. And then, but what's happening as the lynx population is declining, what's going on with the hare population? It's increasing. Why? Yes, exactly. Less predators. So the pressure, predation pressure, is easing on the prey population. And the prey population is set free from that pressure and can reproduce like crazy, right? So what, what do you think happens here? There's a dip. What is coinciding with that dip in the population of prey, you think? <sighs> yeah. Oh. The lynx are like, there's not enough food, so the population is really low. But a couple of a generation goes by and there's plenty of food, so they start growing in numbers again, and that impacts the hair, right? So we can go through this whole graph and follow the exact same pattern up and down all the way through the 1930s or so when this graph stops. But you guys can see that it's a tight cycle, right? As one increases, the other decreases or increases, right? So when there's more food, you can have more links. When there's too many links, the food starts to drop because of competition, right? It's complex and it's very interactive, right? The two are clearly linked. I keep saying links when we're talking about links. I'm not doing that on purpose. Um, the other thing that's sort of interesting to talk about here is the red queen hypothesis. You guys remember talking about that a while back? All it takes all the running you can do to stay in the same place. Do you remember that? It's from Alice in Wonderland, or through the looking glass, I think is the book. But regardless, that's that sort of um, borrowing from literature that biologists do that explains the evolutionary arms race. Right? And if one species gets better at, let's say the lynx gets better at hunting, the hare better get the hair ought to get better at getting away from them or they're not, right? It's co-evolution and this is a really good example of that. Okay, so I think predator-prey dynamics are pretty straightforward. That makes sense, right? Okay, good. They're gonna affect each other, right? The numbers and the, and the dynamics affect one another. Tightly connected. All right, so if you are a prey item or you are food, for somebody else, you have to have a way to defend yourself. Again, with the red queen hypothesis, yes? You have to be able to uh, protect yourself, prevent yourself from being eaten in some way, or you're done, right? In evolutionary terms. Because predation is a strong selective pressure. That selection is for or favoring traits that make you better at evading predation. What does it mean to evade predation? Mm -hmm. not get Do not get eaten, exactly. Yes, so the selective pressure here is going to favor individuals who are better at not becoming food. Okay, so predation is a strong selective pressure. Any irritable trait that gives a species an advantage in evading predators will show up in greater numbers in future generations. This sounds super familiar, right guys? It should. What are we talking about? Yeah, evolution, natural selection, right? That's exactly what we're looking at. Also, on the flip side, the arm race, any trait that makes a predator better at locating and capturing prey will also increase in commonness in offspring, as long as that trait is heritable. If you get a competitive edge as either a prey item or a predator, that's going to give you the advantage that keeps you alive longer, which means you're going to ultimately have more offspring. And because those traits are heritable, those offspring are going to inherit those traits. 
and they're going to be better at surviving too, right? So natural selection in action. So this has caused species to evolve lots of different types of defenses. Some of these we've touched on when we looked at our diversity chapters earlier. So we're revisiting some of these um, examples here. We've got uh, mechanical, chemical, physical, and behavioral defenses. And this is the first time you guys are going to be asked to categorize those defenses. Okay, so we've talked about stuff before, like how plants make secondary metabolites to protect themselves and use quick toxins. Um, we've talked about those types of things, but now we're gonna specifically label them, okay, as sort of types. So anything that you're using to avoid predation can be called a defense. Now, if you're a plant, We've talked about this before too, right? You're not necessarily thinking in terms of predator as much as you're thinking in terms of herbivore, right? You guys with me? So plants don't have to run away. They can't run away. So you don't really describe herbivores or herbivorous organisms that eat plants. You don't really describe them as predators because they're not really hunting, they're foraging. But ultimately, in terms of survival, it's pretty much the same thing. You guys agree? All right, if I'm a deer, or if I'm, let's say I'm a, a, a sapling tree, then a deer looks like a predator to me, yes? Okay, so that's where we're going with this. Um, so when we talk about mechanical defenses, one of the first examples is thorns, okay? Mechanical defenses are defenses that make it difficult for something to eat you mechanically, okay? The reason I'm sort of being very blunt about this is because we're also looking at physical defenses and the term mechanical and physical are close, right? So it can be a little bit tricky. When we're looking at physical defenses, we're actually thinking more about physical appearance. And so you can think of it that way. Mechanical defenses like thorns or body armor, spikes, spines of a cactus, uh, think about porcupines, right? Think about a hard shell like a, tur a turtle, or think about an exoskeleton, like on a crab or a shellfish. Yeah. Chemical. Yep. If you're, he asked if your flesh is toxic. If you're producing uh, chemical defenses, toxins, poisons, venom, any of that could be chemical. Yeah. So that you can have any of these different types. Um, because if your if your flesh is toxic, but you know, it's not hard to chew you. And you have no mechanical defenses. Your, your defenses are strictly chemical. So I don't even know you're gross until I eat you, right? So it's also something that's interesting to think about whether your defenses are going to protect you as the individual from getting eaten or if it's for the greater survival of the species. And you see both. So we'll look at some examples of that too. So mechanical defenses are things like this honey locust tree. It's pretty spiky. You probably don't want to chew on that. It's uh, fairly sharp. Um, so that's an example there. Uh, physical defenses, like I said, are looking at, at um, physical appearance. So things like camouflage, what does it mean to be camouflage? Yeah, you blend in, right? You, you, you don't even appear to be there, right? That's camouflage. Um, we'll look at another slide, the next slide, in fact, that talks about warning coloration, which sometimes goes along with those chemical defenses. like. Maybe you don't know till you eat me that I'm toxic, but I tried to warn you by being brightly colored. So the next time you see something brightly colored, you may not eat it so quickly, right? So we'll look at that too. That would be a physical defense. Um, as we talked about with chemical defenses, you've got things like poison and venom. Do you guys know the difference between poison and venom? Yes. Yes, poison is ingested, venom is injected. The difference? You eat the poison, the venom is injected into you with fangs or a stinger or something like that. Okay? So that's a that's a, a picky distinction, right? So people, somebody said, like, that's a poisonous snake. Well, don't eat it. Okay. It's a venomous snake, right? Okay. Um, and then our last category is behavioral defense. This is things like hiding, burrowing down into a tunnel, running away, fighting. Right, those are all going to be behaviors that are going to be uh, defense mechanisms. So, um, lots of good examples there. Let's see. Oh, plant secondary compounds. I skipped over that. So, that was something that we did talk about before in our plant chapter, but we'll talk about it again. So, this is um, foxglove. Very pretty, right? It uses a chemical defense. 
Um, it produces toxins that cause nausea, vomiting, hallucinations, convulsions, or death when consumed. Other things like nightshade, right, are, are poisonous. If you eat it, you're going to get sick, probably die. But also helpful for humans is that a lot of these plant secondary compounds can be modified into medication. Right? Same with animals, animal chemical compounds like um, rattlesnake venom to make blood pepper and stuff like that. Right? So lots of examples of where we can actually sort of hijack those capabilities, um, but they're originally designed for defense. What about something like caffeine? Who likes caffeine? Pretty much everyone, right? Helps, helps with studying, helps with getting up and getting going in the morning. Um, that is to protect the plant from herbivores. Right? Not necessarily large ones, because we can handle something our size can handle some caffeine, right? We actually like it. But um, something like an insect that's very small and has a lot less biomass and has a sensitive nervous system, caffeine can be a whole different story than just a cup of coffee for a big mammal. Does that make sense? So those are chemical defenses. Um, before we move on to the warning coloration, I want to show you guys this video. If you have to see this in your life. This is an animal that has a whole suite of defenses. So we'll look at this. Million years of evolution has created some very weird body parts. But when it comes to defense, we'll one species has an eye on the prize for weirdness. The horned lizard has three ingenious ways of dealing with predators. Its jagged body provides perfect camouflage against keen eyed aerial hunters. Physical defense, right? Camouflage. This raider hunts by smell, not sight. Spiny armor isn't enough to deter a hungry snake. Mechanical defense. So a five inch yep. lizard pops up its body to almost double its size. This is a great defense. First of all, because when they pop up, it makes them look more intimidating. Secondly, if this snake tries to eat this lizard, it's going to get a mouthful of spikes. Behavioral defense? After popping itself up, the lizard literally flips out. These crazy moves are more than enough to freak this enemy out. But doing it turns a fat brick answer will work on something as big as Fido here. When it faced with something over 10,000 times heavier than itself, this spunky crater doesn't run or hide. It unleashes one of the weirdest defensive body parts on the planet. It's all in the eyes. As someone who studies lizards, this surprises me. When the lizards do this, if I reduce the blood flow out of the head and allow the blood pressure to build up in the vessels all over its face, and at a certain point, the blood pressure in small vessels in the lizard's eye build up so much that they burst, allowing the stream of blood to shoot out. This weird weapon can shoot a stream of blood up to five feet into the air, averaging around ten times in succession. I haven't heard of anything else in nature that can do this, and this is weird. Not only can lizard control when that blood shoots out, they can also shift their eye muscles to control the direction where that street goes. Dogs will eat almost anything, but a mouthful of lizard blood is too much for this one. This dog is running away. This behavior is not just projectile warfare, it's chemical warfare. That fluid is especially repugnant to dogs. This really is a case of getting the July. Uh, you guys heard of horned lizards before? Did you know that was a thing? It's pretty hardcore, right? But the thing I like the most, other than the that fact that that's so weird, uh -huh. is that this guy has physical defense, right? In the beginning, they said he's camouflaged, and you couldn't even see him there in the rocks. He's got mechanical defenses because he's got spines on his skin. He's got the behavioral defense, that weird flipping over the top and out thing he does. And then the ultimate. And that chemical defense, that zookeeper at the end cracks me up on the chemical warfare, but it kind of is, right? Because blood's a chemical and he's shooting it out the lines. Pretty hardcore. All right, now you know you're better for it. 
Let's look at warning coloration. All right, animals use warning coloration to let predators know that they are toxic, which is the same thing as poison. Yeah, they're going to eat it. Uh, or distasteful, or both, right? So sometimes you taste gross, but you aren't toxic. But sometimes you taste gross because you're toxic. Okay, T it turns out that a lot of times when um, animals make these defense compounds, they're alkaloid based and alkaloids are bitter. So um, frequently that's sort of the taste that you get from, from eating something toxic. A good example of this warning coloration, this is a monarch. Um, butterfly and caterpillar. And you can see that the coloration is similar, even though their body types are, are drastically different in those different phases of more metamorphosis. But what happens is uh, monarchs do this preferential open position, just like we talked about with the carver blue butterfly, where they only lay their eggs on a particular species of plants. And in this particular case, they like milkweeds. So, so they use a couple of different things in this family, but they're all going to be milkweed plants. Um, milkweeds make toxins to defend themselves against insect herbivores. Okay, so they're toxic to most insects, but monarch caterpillars don't care. They love it. They're not affected by it. They've adapted good milkweeds and that's what they eat. That's their preferred um, food source. So monarch caterpillars, monarch butterflies, I should start there, lay their eggs on the leaves of milkweed. So when the caterpillars hatch out, they just start munching away as caterpillars will do. And not only are they not affected by the toxins, but they're sequestering those toxins in their own tissues. So they're borrowing the milkweed's ability to make these toxic compounds and storing it up in their tissues. In fact, um, the ter I don't have the term on here, but the word for it would be bioaccumulation. When something eats something else that's toxic, but it doesn't affect them, and they store it in their tissues, oftentimes the effect of that toxin is amplified or the toxin is sort of concentrated in the tissue of the organism that's eating it. And that's what's going on here. So the caterpillars are taking on that toxin, storing it up and becoming even more concentrated with milkweed toxin than um, the leaf itself. Okay, so you've got this warning coloration going on, the yellow, the black, the white, the stripes. It lets something know like a bird, perhaps, that would be likely to eat a caterpillar off of a plant. Like, I'm gross and toxic, don't eat me. Okay? The coolest thing about the whole situation is that once this guy goes into a chrysalis, when he emerges as a monarch butterfly, those same toxins that were in his squishy caterpillar tissue are in the wings. So he moves it into the wing tissue. And now the wings of the monarch butterfly are also harboring those toxins, which also make them toxic and distasteful to bird predators. Um, but you can see that they also have that same color pattern. Like, hey, these bright colors mean you don't want to eat me. So when you're looking at something like a monarch butterfly or this frog with the uh, orange and black underbelly or these heliconius butterflies, um, those are good examples of warning coloration. So it's usually going to be some combination of something that's brightly colored, right? Um, and contrasty, so you get the black and the white on, on each other, or the bright colors that, that um, set, are set off by the dark background. So it's really easy to see. But this is only going to work on visual predators, right? So they were talking about with the, with the um, horned lizard that that snake was hunting by smell and not sight. So that's not going to help, right? Warning coloration isn't, isn't working. But you'll notice that lizard was not using warning coloration, right? He's using all the other things, um, but not this. So not only do you have to have a visual predator that you're sort of adapted to defend yourself against, but your predator also has to have the ability to learn and remember in order for this to work well. Because let's say I'm a predator and I decide to eat uh, this frog, okay? And this frog is warning me that it's toxic, but I don't know that yet because I've never encountered a frog that looks like this before. And to me, he just looks delicious. So I eat it and I get sick, and I die, what good does that do anybody? Not much, right? Unless there are others of my species that see that happen and, and are smart enough to sort of put two and two together, or when this works really well, and if I eat the frog and I don't die, but I get sick, I get sick enough to learn, I don't want to eat that kind of frog again. How helpful is that for that frog? Is it helpful to that individual that I just ate? It's not, because I ate it, right? But it might be helpful to his relatives. You get me? 
So that's an example of sort of um, the predator has to be able to learn because it's going to benefit the species down the line. It's not necessarily going to benefit that frog unless I take one case and take disgusting and I leave them alone, right? Which is why sometimes you get the distasteful, um, this distastefulness that goes along with the toxicity. So it's a, a very specific set of circumstances under which warning coloration works very well, right? Same thing with the monarch, right? So if a bird picks off this guy and he just gets a little taste of the wing, that guy might still live. Sometimes you see butterflies flying around missing a piece, right, of their, of their wing, and they do okay. So maybe that's enough for that bird to learn. This did not taste good, or uh, I did not feel good after I ate this, so I won't do it again. Another interesting sort of turn of events that comes along with the visual uh, warning coloration is mimicry. So what does it mean if you mimic somebody? Do you know? Copying. Like copying, yeah, doing what they're doing. Um, so mimicry is when different species have the same pattern of warning coloration, even though they may or may not share the same toxicity. Okay, so that's the, that's the example here in the Heliconia's butterflies. Some of these are toxic and some of them are harmless. But if you're a visual predator, how can you tell? Can you tell the difference? You really can't, right? So this benefits those who are not toxic are benefited by looking like those that are. So you've got Batesian mimicry, which is where a harmless species imitates the warning coloration of a harmful one. That's pretty clever. I don't even have to spend metabolic energy or resources to build toxins. I can just look like I, like I do, right? That's Batesian mimicry. And then you've got malarian mimicry, which is where multiple species share the same pattern and the same defense. So that would be um, the, the heliconius butterflies that all do have the same toxin and the same coloration. That would be malarian mimicry. Okay, so that's the two different types. Make sense? All right, both are, both are effective in their, in their own ways. All right, warning coloration. All right, how about competitive exclusion principle? This is new. This is really uh, pretty straightforward. So what, what are we talking about? Competition, right? What is exclusion? What does it mean if you are being exclusive or you are excluding someone? What does that mean? Hmm? You're leaving them out or you're kicking them out. You're not letting them in in the first place, right? Like uh, a clubhouse that says no boys allowed. Right? That's exclusive to girls only. No boys can come in here. So competitive exclusion means that you are using competition to kick someone else out. Okay? And this is a principle. So this is an overarching sort of con uh, concept in ecology. Then, and it all comes down to your ecological niche, which is a term that we've used before throughout the semester, definitely. I think this is the first time we're giving it an official definition. But your ecological niche is your unique set of resources that your, that your species uses, including interactions with other species. So your symbioses and your comp competition, the, the, your cooperations and things like that. Um, basically, what the competitive exclusion principle says is that two species cannot share the exact same set of circumstances that they need to live. They can't occupy an identical ecological niche. And they can't fit into exactly the same place if they live in the same community because there's too much overlap and too much competition. So they can't coexist if they're competing for all the same resources. There can be some overlap, but it can't be 100%. Either one species or both species will adapt to reduce the overlap and coexist peacefully or otherwise, which reduces competition, or the species that is better, more efficient, and using the resources will drive the other species out, drive them to extinction, or at least out of that community. And it can't, they can't coexist if one outcompetes the other. But you either have to adapt and share, or one gets kicked out. That's competitive exclusion. Okay. Um, the term for that coexistence that you can achieve is called niche partitioning. You guys know what the word partition means? Like, not in science, but just in the world. You know that term? Yeah. So if I wanted to pull this thing, and close it. This is the partition. Right? It's just separate. So I can close this and then we have two rows instead of one. So partitioning just means to separate or to, to break up into pieces. So niche partitioning is exactly that. 
that species can differentiate the resources that they're using and share peacefully that each partitioning and then they can coexist. If they can't do it, they exclude one another. Um, I really like this graphic because it's very simple and it sort of illustrates what's going on. So species, uh, the yellow bird species is living peacefully in this habitat, uh, making use of forage, uh, ground forage, mid-story and canopy, right? All is well. And then the red species moves in and they're both competing for everything and it's not gonna work because of the competitive exclusion principle. So what happens? What do you see in the third frame? Is it competitive exclusion or is it niche partitioning? What do you guys think? A niche partitioning, anyone agree or disagree? Agree? Yeah, niche partitioning, look, they're shared. The red uh, species is now just living there on the trunk and we got yellow in the canopy and on the ground. So they've successfully shared. This is super oversimplified, right? But it's a nice illustration of concept. Um, so this is in principle. Let's look at it in practice or in vitro. You guys heard the term in vitro before? What does in vitro mean? You know? Where have you heard it? In vitro fertilization. What is that? What is what is what is in vitro fertilization? Yeah, artificial insemination is involved, right? What are you trying to do? What's the end goal? Yeah, so to have a baby, right? A pregnancy. But it's not working in natural conditions. So you take it in vitro. So in vitro just means it's done in a laboratory. That's a good term to know going forward in your career, okay? Um, it actually means in glass. So it, it really comes from talking about doing things in the test tube or doing things in a petri dish. In vitro means in glass, but it refers to in the lab. Okay, um, if you see in vivo, what do you think that means? You heard that before or seen that before? You guys can see it in the zoom. So we got in vitro. This is in a lab. How about in? Guesses? Yeah, kind of. It means in life. Have you ever heard like Viva Las Vegas or Viva Mexico? Like long live. That's what Vivo means in life. So this means in, in real life. Sometimes you might see in situ. Ever seen that? And they're going to help you guys when you're reading papers and stuff, especially conservation papers or uh, model organism papers, right, that you're all working on. In situ means like as situated, kind of like in the field, same thing. That means like I'm looking at this uh, horned lizard in its natural habitat. So in situ, this is, I found, this is how I found it. This is where it was. I didn't manipulate it at all. So in vivo, in vivo and in situ kind of mean the same thing, but slightly different. Uh, one more, and then we'll go back to talking about ecology, because this one might be helpful to you as well. Even in ecology, you might see in silico. What do you think? What does silico make you think of? Silicone. So what do you think that might mean? Where do, what is it? What happens in Silicon Valley, California? Technology. Yep, computers. So in silico, usually refers to a computer model. You're welcome, vocabulary. <laughs> no, I feel like in science, we toss these around and no one ever takes the time to like explain what it means. Um, so if you've never heard it before, and now you know. Anyway, some terms. So we're talking about a competitive exclusion principle. Now we're watching it happen in vitro. So where is this happening? Hmm? In a lab, yeah. So under laboratory conditions, which is great because you can control it and you can see what happens. So this is a real experiment that's really done, real data. Um, an experiment with two protist species, uh, Paramecium aurelia and Paramecium caudatum. And this is aurelia and this is caudatum. They were very exciting and interesting organisms to, to research on, right? Um, but they are uh, unicellular, so they grow quickly and you can, you can do a pretty effective experiment 
they live independently of one another in vitro, great. They thrive, right? You put them in their own um, their own test tube or flask or whatever it is that you're growing them in. They do just fine. So if you look at the graph of P. aurelia by itself, starting off with super low numbers over about 15 days, you see a pretty typical S-shaped curve, right? Not right S, but you get what I'm saying, right? So they start to grow and then growth sort of peaks here where you they're starting to compete with one another. Then they kind of level off at carrying capacity. They're doing just fine. Condatum, largely the same. Right, starts off low and boy, they got here early, but then does pretty well. So they thrive just fine when you have them independently. You're feeding them, you're taking care of them, they're doing everything the same. When you put them together in the same blast, what happens? Competition, right? And so who wins? Can you guys tell by looking at the graph? Yeah, P. aurelia outcompetes P. caudatum until caudatum goes extinct. Repetitive exclusion. Or whatever it is about those laboratory conditions, uh, Paramecium aurelia is better at uh, acquiring those resources, so much better that it starves out the other species. Competitive exclusion. Brilliant example. I wonder if we could recreate that. That would be fun. Don't you think? Shine's eyes got real big. Either like, yeah, or like, please don't make it. This semester is over, and I can make the next one. <laughs> I'm just thinking down, little, down the road, that might be fun. Fun with protons. All right, cool. That's competition. So we've done predator prey. We've talked about defenses. We did competitive exclusions. We've talked a ton about competition already, so I'm not too worried about that. And symbiosis is review as well for most, most of these concepts. Um, there are three types of symbiosis that I will expect you to know the difference between and some of them we've already talked about, probably all of them at one point or another. Um, but I'm going to give you again case studies. Okay, I'm going to describe a relationship between two or more organisms and I'm going to ask you what kind of symbiosis is this. So first of all, what is symbiosis? Maybe, yeah. So the first part is always true. Two organisms or more, different species that live together and interact intimately, right? Depending upon one another in some, in some critical way. The second part of what Cheyenne says is that they're benefiting each other, which is sometimes true of symbiosis, right? That would be mutualism. Mutually beneficial. What does mutual mean? Yeah, both parties, right? Both parties have benefited. Both species benefit from the interaction. An example would be lichens. We talked about lichens, oh, back in the, I can't remember, maybe the fungi chapter. But these are a, a symbiosis between a fungus and a photosynthetic alga or cyanobacterium. Um, new research has actually showed that there's a third member that we didn't even know about all this time. So all these lichenologists, in for a big surprise, like a year ago, or a year or two ago, when this paper came out and said there's a third species and it's a yeast. So groundbreaking stuff, right? But it's actually pretty interesting to study symbiosis because we didn't even know that yeast species was there. We just assumed it was a fungus who's really good at um, extracting mineral nutrients from things like rocks. And then um, a photosynthetic partner that can't get its own mineral nutrition very well, but can photosynthesize the organic stuff. And so they share, right? And then they make lichen. And without either of those partners, turns out it doesn't um, do well. Lichens don't exist when one of the other partner isn't around. And, and in some species, as I just mentioned, it also requires that third uh, participant in the yeast. So everybody wins, everybody benefits. That's mutualism. Sometimes you might have a relationship where one species benefits from the interaction, but the other species isn't really affected. Not benefited, but not harmed either. Just kind of like along for the ride, and that's commensalism. Okay, so you live together, one of you's loving it, the other one's like, eh, all right, couldn't care less either way. It's not doing anything. So the example we have here is this bird in the tree. What is the, what's going on here? What is this relationship between these two species? Who is benefiting? The bird, why? Yeah, he's building a nest there. What's it doing for the tree? Nothing, probably, right? Now there are exceptions. 
they're going to be a uh, symbiotic relationship between birds and trees where the bird uh, excrement is actually fertilizing the tree, right? So that would be an exception. Or where there's so many nests in trees that shade out the leaves and cause the dip in photosynthesis, and that would be harmful. But that's not what we're talking about. Okay, we're not talking about the exception. In this case, in the general sense, the bird is benefiting because it has a, a sort of protected area hidden up off the ground, safe place to raise its young, but the, the tree doesn't care, right? That would be commensalism. Um, your gut microbes, all the thousands of, of species of bacteria that could possibly be living in your intestines, some of them are benefiting you, and it's a mutual relationship, right? So they are definitely benefiting, right? How are prokaryotes living in your gut benefiting? What are they getting? Nutrients, a nice, warm, perfect temperature, moist place to live. It's a pretty, pretty sweet setup for a bacteria, right? Um, in our case, what are we getting out of the deal? We talked about this back in our prokaryote chapter, but you've got some species that are doing things like helping you digest fiber. You've got other species that are making vitamin K that you can't synthesize on your own. You've got other species that are helping in your immune defenses, right? So those are mutualisms. But there are also species of prokaryotes that live in your gut that do nothing for you, but they don't hurt you either. They're just there and it's fine, right? You don't even know. And so that's commensalism. And then our third one, which is really interesting to study, is parasitism. What is a parasite? What does a parasite do? It feeds off of a host. Yeah. It has to have a host to complete its life cycle in some way or another. Um, the parasite benefits and the host is harmed. So something, somehow it costs the host organism to, to be the host for this parasite. So lots of animal parasites. We talked about tapeworms, right? Lots of protist parasites. Um, we don't frequently talk about plant parasites. I'd like to talk about this in the plant chapters, but we didn't have time. So now you're in luck. This is a species that's the most interesting of all the species. This is a species I worked on in grad school. Um, this is a genus of, uh, of plants called cascuta. It's in the same family as morning glories. You guys know what morning glories are? Like those pretty round flowers. They're all around this time of year, white, blue, pink sometimes. But they're super viney. They grow up like stop signs, or if you're looking at a fence, or sometimes they choke out your garden. It's really competitive. People hate them, but they're really pretty. Um, but they're not parasitic. But Cascuta is a genus within that family of morning glories that is parasitic. And so what it does is it doesn't photosynthesize. It doesn't even ever grow leaves. It sprouts up out of the ground, finds a host, wraps around the stem, and digs in to the, to the stem tissue and makes connections with the vascular system of the host plant. We didn't talk about this before in here, did we? No, I didn't think we had time. So this, this, in this picture, the purple flower, that's the host. Okay, that's why Atris microcephala, they have this particular species grows on a rock outside. So that's what you're looking at here. So these are just small little herbaceous flowers, but the orange stuff is tiny little vines, very similar to what you would see in morning glory vines, but it wraps around the stem. Looks kind of like orange silly string if you get enough of it in one place. And it makes these little, these little suckers that literally become Cellularly, they imitate the cells of the island of clone so they can integrate right in there. And the host plant doesn't even know it's there and starts to feed it as if it was making a flower or a fruit. So the, the parasite becomes a sink, a nutrient sink for the plant. So the plant is photosynthesizing away and it's feeding this other plant, doesn't even realize that it's there. Um, so that, that plant, the host plant, in this case, Laetris, is losing photosynthase and water and anything that it's collecting for itself in the cascuda is doing nothing except just sucking it all in. So they have roots. As soon as that connection grows up out of the ground, finds a host, wraps around, digs in, and then the connection from the ground to the to where that connection to the host started dries up, disappears. It doesn't even connect to the ground anymore. Isn't that weird? Anyway, long story short, long story longer, that's parasitism. Okay. Good? All right, cool. So know those three different types, um, if I give you an example. All right, we are getting pretty close to the end here. That's good, we're doing great. Um, so community characteristics, we've talked about some of those interactions. Now we're gonna talk about how we can actually describe communities themselves. 
Um, we can look at community structure. That's the diversity piece. That's who's there, um, how many of them are there, how do they how do they relate in terms of um, population size with one another. Um, and then we can also look at dynamics. And community dynamics is just how communities change. So what do we say about populations? They're always changing, right? They're dynamic. Well, because communities are built of populations, they're also dynamic and always changing. So uh, looking at structure, in the next few slides, we'll look at diversity. We'll look at what foundation species are. We've talked about that before, but we'll review it. Um, keystone species, which might be new for us, and invasive species, which are important to talk about, especially moving into talking about diversity and conservation issues. Um, the only real section we're going to spend on dynamics is right here. So this is just talking about the fact that communities change. Communities are subject to things like disturbances, something that comes in and wipes everything out or sets the re pushes the reset button, and then they have to recover. And the way in which communities recover from disturbances is referred to as succession. You might have heard the term succession before applied to um, like royal families. Like who's next in line for the throne and who's 10th in line from the throne? That's the line of succession. You guys heard that term before? It just means who comes next. So if you have a disturbance like a forest fire, so we talked about the um, pine barren, oak pine barren habitats where the carter blue butterfly and the um, wild lupin grow. We talked about fire as a as an ecological necessity, right? Um, a non-living component of the ecosystem, but it comes in, rips through, burns everything to the ground. Who grows back first? That's going to be the lupin, right? And other small herbaceous things that are fire tolerant. And then if you let uh, that community go long enough, without a fire, then you're going to start to see those larger tree species creep into the, to the habitat. That's why fire is necessary to keep sort of resetting that, um, resetting the stage for the lupin. So disturbances can be good. And then the succession is the sequential appearance and disappearance of species after the recovery from that disturbance. So if you let a, a, an oak pine barren habitat go long enough without burning it and the trees all move in, that may shade out the lupin and the loop and pull out, right? So that's appearance and disappearance. So that's what succession means. Um, what I will also ask you to do is be able to tell the difference between a natural disturbance that changes the community dynamics versus an anthropogenic disturbance. And what did I tell you guys that anthropogenic means? Remember? People did it, created by people, caused by humans. So things like uh, development. Right, that's going to reset a community potentially. When we come in and build our baseball field over here, and we wipe out a bunch of trees. That's natural, sorry, anthropogenic disturbance. Um, if we introduce an invasive species that takes over in a community where it didn't exist before, that's our fault, right? That's anthropogenic disturbance. Um, habitat fragmentation. We came in and built Highway 20 through the middle of this forest and put a collar in a Walmart, that's fragmenting that habitat that you can take it, right? So that would be examples of anthropogenic. Natural disturbances, these are pretty easy to tell the difference between if you're looking at natural, you're looking at things like fire, that, that tornado, hurricanes, blizzards, droughts. Okay, so just be able to tell the difference between those two. That's pretty easy, I think. And man cause or natural, right? That's pretty straightforward. All right, let's look briefly at biodiversity. Um, I already told you guys what biodiversity is, right? It's just the number and variety of different organisms living in a particular place. Um, we're gonna look at how to do species richness versus relative abundance calculations in the next chapter. So I'm not gonna spend a ton of time talking about it here. Um, so richness just refers to the number of species in a particular system. So if you go and you start counting how many different populations of different species you have in a place, that's your species richness. How rich is this place in diversity, biodiversity? Um, remember how we talked about that being related to latitude? Where, um, if you're talking in terms of latitude, where is the most diverse, or the most diversity on Earth found? Equator, yeah, zero. So this is just another one of those sort of um, color-coded maps. This one is for uh, mammals. 
think the last one we looked at was amphibians or something maybe, but anyway, um, you can see that the number of, of mammal species as it increases, the color of the green color gets darker and fewer is lighter. So what do you see? This is the same pattern you've seen in all maps, right? That we looked at with productivity, with species diversity. Where it's warm and temperate, you have more, more biodiversity. And as you move towards both poles, it drops off. Right? So that's just talking about one measure of um, biodiversity in terms of how many species live there. In the next chapter, like I said, we'll do some examples of calculating relative abundance, which is how many individuals of one species uh, relative to the total number of all species within a system. So it's a fraction. Okay? It's really pretty straightforward. You just count how many individuals of, let's say, um, let's say you're looking at people and their dogs. Okay, so your community is people and pets. And then you count the number of people plus pets and you get 100. But there are 60 people and 40 pets. Then 60 out of 100 is your relative abundance of people. Does that make sense? It's just a fraction. How many of this total community is made up of each one of those species? Okay, we're gonna, like I said, do some calculations in the next chapter and talk more about why it matters in terms of calculating and um, classifying organ, um, habitats as diverse or less diverse, more or less diverse. Cool, biodiversity, measure of community structure. All right, um, within a community, you may have a foundation species. We talked about these guys uh, when we were looking at coral reefs. So a foundation species forms the physical um, habitat. Well, that is a coral reef. I thought that was a kelp forest on this slide for some reason. But that's another good example. Um, anything that is living but also creates the physical habitat for the rest of the community is the foundation species. It's building the foundation. It's the bedrock of the community. Right? If it's gone, there's nowhere for everyone else to live. You guys remember talking about this with coral like a week ago, right? Yeah. Foundation species gives um, habitat frequently primary producers because frequently you'll see a greater abundance of producers than you see of anything else. What are producers? Primary producers. Yeah, they're low in the food chain. They're the photosynthesizers. Yep, absolutely. Um, and usually has a high relative abundance, meaning there's a lot of them compared to the rest of the species in the community, which also makes sense if they're making the habitat right. Um, so we'll, I will ask you to compare foundation species and keystone species, and this gets a little bit tricky because they can be, an organism can be both. But a keystone, a keystone species is one whose presence in a community is key or vital to maintaining the structure of the community and that community's biodiversity. When you take a keystone species out, the ecosystem changes, the interactions shift. Um, numbers of, of populations change. A really good example of this is wolves in Yellowstone. Have you guys ever heard the story of how wolves were removed and then reintroduced into Yellowstone National Park and what happened? One, one person is nodding. All right. Um, well, the bullet points here kind of tell the story, but there's a video that's actually way better at telling it than I probably would explain it. So I'll just play that for you. And I think we'll end with keystone species and then we'll talk about the poster since more folks have come in and we're almost done for today. When school is no place here to be, that's why I have to have a school or a home, right? Okay. One of the most exciting scientific findings of the past half century has been the discovery of Wait, widespread trophic cascades. A trophic cascade is an ecological process that starts at the top of the food chain and tumbles all the way down to the bottom. Uh, and a classic example of what happened in the Yellowstone National. Okay. I think that could go. I'm going to.
Now I can, were you guys gonna tell me? They just kind of let me think of. One of the most exciting scientific findings of the past half century has been the discovery of widespread trophic cascades. A trophic cascade is an ecological process that starts at the top of the food chain and tumbles all the way down to the bottom. And the classic example is what happened in the Yellowstone National Park in the United States when wolves were reintroduced in 1995. We all know that wolves kill various species of animals, but perhaps we're slightly less aware that they give life to many others. Before the wolves turned up, they'd been absent for 70 years, but the numbers of deer, because they're not in comfort, have built up and built up in the Yellowstone Park, and despite efforts by humans to control them, they managed to reduce much of the vegetation there to almost nothing. They just grazed it. But as soon as the wolves arrived, even though they were few in number, they started to have the most remarkable effects. First, of course, they killed some of the deer, but that wasn't the major thing. Much more significantly, they radically changed the behavior of the deer. The deer started avoiding certain parts of the park, the places where they could be trapped most easily, particularly the valleys and the gorges. And immediately, those places started to regenerate. In some areas, the height of the trees quintupled in just six years. Bare valley sides quickly became forests of aspen and willow and cottonwood. And as soon as that happened, the birds started moving. The number of songbirds and migratory birds started to increase greatly. The number of beavers started to increase because beavers like to, to eat the trees. And beavers like wolves are ecosystem engineers, they create niches. For other species, and the dams they built in the rivers uh, provided habitats for otters, and muskrats, and ducks, and fish, and reptiles, and amphibians. The wolves killed coyotes, and as a result of that, the number of rabbits and mice began to rise, which meant more hawks, more weasels, more foxes, more rabbits. Ravens and bald eagles came down to feed on the carrier that the wolves had left. Bears came too, and their population began to rise as well, partly also because there were more berries growing on the regenerating shrubs. And the bears reinforced the impact of the wolves by killing some of the calves of the deer. Here's where it gets really interesting. The wolves changed the behavior of the rivers. They began to meander less. There was less Erosion, the channels narrowed, more pools formed, more riffle sections, all of which are great for wildlife habitat. The rivers change in response to the wolves. And the reason was that the regenerating forests stabilized the banks so that they collapsed less often, so that the rivers became more fixed in their course. Similarly, by driving the deer out of some places and the vegetation recovering on the valley sides, there is a solid erosion because the vegetation stabilized that as well. So the wolves, small in number, transform not just the ecosystem of the Yellowstone National Park, this huge area of land, but also its physical geography. Do you guys know why the uh, wolves were moved in the first place? So, um, up until like the early 1900s or so, you could even get money from the government for killing wolves um, in this country because they were seen as like a nuisance. But if you live out by Yellowstone and you were ran a rancher, why do you think wolves are a nuisance to ranchers? Yeah, they kill their livestock. So um, they, they were actually they were actually encouraged to get wolves out, and they essentially drove them out or killed them all um, until they were gone. Even in Yellowstone, and Yellowstone is one of the most uh, one of the only places in the country where wolves are actually protected. Um, 
And since they reintroduced a few wolves in 95, the, um, it's been super successful. And uh, all the other diversity recovered as they were sort of talking about in the video. Uh, and again, the most interesting thing is how the actual physical geography was changed, right? Because without all the deer eating all of the vegetation at the sides of the river, right? So trees and, and shrubs hold those roots, hold soil in place, right? We were talking about that back in the plants chapter. So without those uh, trees and shrubs, the river was able to sort of widen. Right, which changes everything. So really good example of a keystone species um, in the wolf. So what I was gonna do is I'm uh, erasing this during the video. And if you know anything about architecture, when you build an arch, an arch is a pretty strong structure, right? And if you're building it out of stones, do you guys know where the keystone goes? Which one? This one, right? That's your keystone. So, what happens if you remove that keystone out of an arch? The whole thing collapses, right? So, that's why we call these keystone species. So, um, do you think a keystone species can be a foundation species? Hmm? Sure, right? Can a foundation species be a keystone species? probably always, right? If you remove the foundation species, which is providing the physical habitat for the rest of the community, you're likely to see community structure collapse. So I would say foundation species are probably always keystone species, but is a keystone species always a foundation species? No, why not? Yeah, a wolf isn't making the habitat. It's definitely their presence is influencing it, but they're not providing the physical habitat like coral in a reef or kelp in a kelp forest or something like that. So yeah, good. Okay, we'll save invasive species. That's the last thing we'll talk about in this chapter. Uh, we'll save that for Monday because I want to look at the poster stuff real quick before we're back today. And uh, we're right on track to finish up the rest of it.